Hello, and welcome to Historia Ecclesiastica. My name is Daniel Sudi, and in this The Enlightenment and the World Wars video, we will be addressing how fascism, especially the fascism of Mussolini's Italian regime, is yet another rotten fruit of the Enlightenment. Let's begin with a prayer that comes from the Book of Revelation. This is a canticle which is sung in the Divine Office on Sunday evenings, and it sings about how God is the one true king of all the universe. And one day, all of human society will reflect that God is king, not any leftist ideology. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Alleluia. Salvation, glory, and power to our God. His judgments are honest and true. Alleluia. Alleluia. Sing praise to our God, all you his servants, all who worship him reverently, great and small. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord, our all-powerful God, is king. Let us rejoice, sing praise, and give him glory. Alleluia. We pray this hymn of praise through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you could please like, share, and subscribe, and uh, don't forget to engage in the comment section, which has been quite lively. I appreciate it from all those who are new to the channel um, and are here even to disagree. I appreciate your disagreements. Hopefully you can watch a little bit of the video and leave a specific content a specific comment on what was actually said and not just the thumbnail. So in this video, we're going to have a historiographical discussion about the style of historiography that I use in um, this YouTube channel in general, especially in my treatment of uh, Hitler and fascism. I'm going to present a critique of the traditional historiography of the left-right uh, political categorization system. I'm going to propose a new classification of political regimes based on the philosophical foundations of these regimes, which is different from uh, the typical conception of which ideologies are left-wing, which are right-wing. This is reviewing content that I went over in the last video, but I think it needs some reinforcing and revisiting. Then we're going to examine the philosophical foundations of Mussolini's fascism, which I can verify here, emerge from the atheistic enlightenment system of thought that also caused the other uh, leftist political ideologies of the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, while different in its specific style of realizing the ideals of the atheistic, atheistic enlightenment from other ideologies like communism and then like French atheistic republicanism, fascism is still a manifestation of the philosophically liberal, atheistic premises of the Enlightenment. Then we will conclude the video by properly placing the fascist movement according to commonalities this movement held in its philosophical premises with other political movements. All right, so we're going to begin with a historiographical overview of the style of historiography that I use here at Historia Ecclesiastica, and then I'll revisit some of the criticisms of the video, which was originally titled Hitler Was Liberal, and I'll explain why I renamed the video. So my historiographical approach to political classification of different movements as left-wing or right-wing. In my previous video, I did face a lot of criticism from the commenters for the initial premise of the video, likely just the thumbnail. I don't necessarily think that most of the commenters watched much of the video. It seemed like most were addressing the thumbnail itself. Hitler was liberal, is what the thumbnail originally said. Um, most criticisms, the, the vast majority, probably excluding a couple of criticisms, were due to um, the, the classification of Hitler as liberal in the thumbnail rather than the connections drawn between Hitler's ideology and the philosophers and activists that he had clear connections to. And uh, those German Enlightenment philosophers or even American activists that I referenced would, would typically be deemed liberal by today's usage of the term and also the usage that I defined early on in the video that I was using liberal to refer to um, liberal philosophical movements in relationship to the traditional uh, Christian values and political premises or political values. I doubt many of these commenters would have passionately argued with my definition of terms if my thumbnail had rather stated Hitler was a far-right conservative. I don't think many would have taken issue with that, betraying likely um, a little bit of uh, ideological bias and 
why there was such a nuanced disagreement about definitions of terms. All the same, I think there's a need for a clear explanation of my historiographical approach to this topic. I will respond as well to a number of, of what I thought were more thoughtful criticisms here, and I will define my historiographical approach in general. Uh, once again, though, just to review, I ended up pinning this comment to the video stating that as a reminder, the term liberal in this video was defined from the onset as being, quote, liberal or free in relationship to traditional Christian moral values and print political principles, end quote, especially in a manner which was inspired by the Enlightenment. And I do understand that there are a wide variety of alternative definitions of the term liberal, but that is the definition which I was using while arguing that Hitler was liberal. That is what I mean when I say Hitler was liberal, that he was liberal or free in relationship to Christian moral values and political principles, especially in a manner which was inspired by the Enlightenment. And I still affirm that I think that that is clearly demonstrated in that video. Now, I arrive at that definition because of my historiographical approach in general on this channel. Historiography um, in general, that refers to the approach that a historian takes to analyzing and finding patterns in historical data. My goal has always been to tell the narrative of the Catholic Church on this channel, hence the name, hence the logo for the channel here, of uh, that the history of the Catholic Church emanates out from Jesus the Vine, and uh, we are all bound to the sacred tradition and the deposit of faith, which was passed on through sacred tradition. So the point of this channel is to tell the narrative of the Catholic Church. Uh, this stems from my firm belief that the Church is the most exalted form of human society, and it is, in fact, the, the only eternal human society. And so because I am analyzing uh, all temporal societies in reference to the eternal society of the church, I have a wider and broader perspective. And so when I'm looking at the development of political ideologies in the 20th century, I'm going to be addressing, okay, well, where do those ideologies come from? Why are those ideologies so different from the political values of medieval Christian European society? So even from a secular perspective, uh, there is a value to examining the revolutionary changes in the West uh, during the 19th and 20th centuries, especially in comparing those new political ideologies to the more stable medieval political values of the medieval period. Um, when I refer to the Nazis, and in this video, fascists, as essentially left-wing or liberal, I'm arguing that these movements emanate out of the secular and liberal enlightenment in the same manner that other political movements have emerged out of the atheistic premises of this philosophical movement. I believe that 500 years from now, the connections between the enlightenment and republicanism, communism, Nazism, fascism, and other um, you know, late modern political ideologies will be more clear, but perhaps in uh, the present day, people are more used to a very narrow examination of Nazism, and they're less comfortable looking for connections between Nazism and the German Enlightenment thought which inspired it. My desire to explore this approach to history of examining all of history in relation to the church um, led me to attain a master's degree at a secular university, so I, I do possess a master's degree. I um, earned a 4.0 in that master's degree uh, by using all secular and just, you know, the typical, I believe, Enlightenment-inspired academic methods that are pragmatically atheistic. I was able to use those methods, once again, to earn that degree with those honors, and um, at the same time, I underwent that training so that I could you know, use that training to explore an integration of the secular erudition that I learned in the university uh, with an uncompromising commitment to divine revelation, which is the infallible bedrock of truth. And because it's the bedrock of truth, I knew they could be integrated, even though they typically were not integrated by historians. And it was my desire to integrate uh, belief in divine revelation with the methodologies of secular historians. So World War II in general, as I mentioned, is not generally examined with such a broad centuries-long historiographical approach. Historians typically examine how, if they are going to take a more broad approach to uh, World War II, they're typically examining how centuries of anti-Semitism led to the Holocaust. I believe it is more rare to see texts pointing out connections between Hitler's thought and the Enlightenment-inspired liberalism of the 19th century German and French philosophers and scientists, and that's what I sought to do in the previous video. 
granted, taking a multi-centuries approach to any historical topic runs the risk of oversimplifying historical developments. That's inevitable when you take a multi-centuries approach to his to a historical event. At the same time, only examining historical events in a decades by decades approach, zooming in on it, um, has equally negative effects. It blinds the historian to seeing wider historical patterns, um, and that's also. Um, harmful to our overall historical picture when we can't see how philosophical movements in one century led to a development in a later century. I think Christian historians are more willing to see how an 18th century philosophical movement inspired a 20th century pol political ideology because, of course, Christian historians, uh, by definition, have a wider perspective of Western civilization than most secular historians. In the video, Hitler was liberal, which I've renamed, and I'll explain why in a moment, I demonstrate thoroughly that Hitler was in fact inspired by a great deal of German Enlightenment thinkers and was step for step with other intellectuals who are commonly recognized today as having a progressive or even liberal mindset, such as Margaret Sanger, even while Margaret Sanger and Hitler disagreed about um, sexual morality in general, Margaret Sanger placed a higher, viral a higher value on um, just basically sexual revolution values, Hitler placed a higher value on using sex for his eugenics. Um, but Margaret Sanger and Hitler both believed in eugenics, just Margaret Sanger prioritized the values of the sexual revolution more so. And I understand the sexual revolution did not technically break out till the 60s, but Margaret Sanger was a kind of a, a grandmother of that movement. Um, I appreciate that my channel has gotten some exposure to people that are not typically used to seeing any sort of Christian historiography whatsoever. Christ even the concept of Christian historiography in the secular university is treated as though it was simply a thing of the past. It was outdated. It was a medieval style of looking at history. Um, as you can see in these comments here, um, some people seem to be sort of appalled that they're even stumbling across Christian historiography as a result of YouTube's algorithm, which I think is a really good thing. In fact, in the Hitler was liberal video, um, about 76% of the viewers were, in fact, viewers who had never seen my channel before, indicating that they're not trying to find Christian historiography. So that's an explanation about why the comments were um, of the nature that they were. Now, I want to address a few disagreements um, in the comment section. There was a lot of disagreements arguing with my definition of liberal in general, as you can see in these comments here and then this one here. Um, a lot of the comments disagreeing with my definition of liberal were offering uh, a variety of definitions of liberal, indicating that the term liberal is very difficult to define. Um, here's another one arguing that the definition of liberal, uh, they disagreed with it. If the term liberal and left wing means different things in different points in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th, and then late 20th century, and sometimes the terms liberal and left wing were synonyms and sometimes they were not, both are, frankly, entirely unuseful terms. It's not useful as a historian to have a term which you need to know the definition of it in each particular decade. If it changes that often, it's not a very good term. Inspired by the etymology of the left-right spectrum of the 1789 French Assembly, which I'll review in a little bit here, um, I have argued that all political movements that have emerged with clear origins in the pragmatically atheistic premises of the Enlightenment can be described as left-wing because... For my approach to history, looking at the broad strokes over centuries, if I'm going to use a term at all, it needs to be a term that has logical consistency um, for the entire period in which I'm using it. And so when I use the word liberal, I'm looking back to the origin of the term liberal or left wing, both of which referred to those who would have sat on the left wing of the French Assembly when there were debates being held over the French Revolution. Uh, throughout the series, I have also articulated that I'm using the term liberal to describe, again, a liberal relationship with the traditional beliefs and values of Western tr Christendom. Remember that this channel is focused on the narrative of the church's history, and thus the history of all of Western civilization, and not just the 20th century. I have also used the terms enlightenment-inspired and pragmatically atheistic to describe this ideology alongside the use of the term liberal. This definition of liberal is synonymous with the original definition of left-wing in the 1789 French Assembly. In my opinion, attempts to separate the left-wing, right-wing spectrum to economic ideology and the liberal conservative spectrum to cultural ideology seems arbitrary and also problematic because, in practice, economic and cultural theories emerge from a single system of philosophical beliefs which inform both. 
In other words, it's arguable whether economic and cultural liberalism are separable at all. Both emerge from an ideology which informs how all of society should be organized. In other words, people have an ideology that an underlying set of beliefs. And for progressive liberalism, um, pragmatically atheistic thought, Enlightenment-inspired thought, that ideology is, as I just said, it's pragmatically atheistic. It's it's um, extremely rationalistic. It's um, only looking at what can be empirically verified as true. So that underlying set of philosophical beliefs is going to lead to a certain um, set of economic and cultural beliefs. Um, for example, so-called liberal capitalists in the United States are virtually always in favor of a huge welfare state, which borrows from Marxism. So even if we're calling them liberal capitalism, like kind of old school Democrats in the United States, they still lean much more towards communist than um, what you would call a conservative in the United States. In the video, Hitler was liberal. I examined clear connections between Hitler and the liberal cultural forces in America and the in the eugenics movement in general. I demonstrated that Hitler's ideology was in large part influenced by social Darwinism, scientific racism, and eugenics, all commonly accepted branches of the secular sciences during his lifetime. Um, and that's not something that I necessarily came up with in his treatment of transhumanism in the atheistic book Sapiens. The historian Harari argued that Nazism was inspired by what was deemed at the time as a legitimate scientific theory regarding uh, race. And so Harari, who is probably left-leaning, but is, is a pretty reasonable atheistic writer, um, he argues that Nazism was inspired by the cutting-edge science at the time when science, um, concerning what science had to say about race and eugenics. I also showed convincingly that Hitler drew from the philosophical works of a great number of German Enlightenment thinkers. This compilation of evidence shows that Hitler's Nazism did not emerge to conserve the values of traditional Western civilization, but he was offering his own interpretation on how to progress Western civilization towards a left-wing utopia according to his own interpretation of the atheistic philosophy and science of the post-Enlightenment West. And he believed he was doing so in a similar manner to one of his personal greatest heroes, Napoleon Bonaparte, another despot who was inspired entirely by the Enlightenment. Now, looking at the thumbnail I used, as a YouTube creator, I do have to balance creating thumbnails which generate a provocative response and interest while not being misleading. I don't think my description of Hitler as liberal is inaccurate or misleading, considering the definitions of terms that I provided and have just reviewed. All the same, considering how the majority of the discussion in the comments section is overly focused on the definition of the term liberal, I have replaced the thumbnail with one which says, Hitler, a son of the Enlightenment, in order to communicate more clearly the purpose of the video to those who intend to judge its contents only by the thumbnail. Now, I did have one lengthy comment which was arguing that uh, Hitler was in fact conservative, and I want to address some of the points here. I'm not going to read his entire comment for the sake of time. If you want to pause and read what he said, you can look here. Um, but I'm going to read my responses to his main points. Um, so he argued that Hitler was conservative because Hitler opposed Freemasonry. Freemasonry was in favor of liberal republicanism, which Nazism opposed as the best way to manifest the ideals of the Enlightenment, even if Freemasonry and Nazism were both inspired by the liberal Enlightenment. Hitler outlawed prostitution, pornography, and homosexuality. Um, one might consider these uh, laws to be conservative. However, this was a preservation of the status quo in all but communist nations at this time. So Hitler was not being as liberal as communists, perhaps, but he was not necessarily being more conservative than other liberal regimes at the time. Abortion laws, which Hitler published, were clearly inspired by eugenics, not conservative ideals. He outlawed abortion for the Aryan race, but he did not outlaw it and likely encouraged it for lesser races because he saw abortion as a vehicle for eugenics, just like Margaret Sanger did. Um, he wrote how he opposed uh, usury. In a socialist economy, loans... So Hitler did run a nationalist socialist economy, and uh, loans were not as necessary as they would have been in a capitalist economy, because it wasn't as necessary to uh, provide entrepreneurs with the capital to begin a new industry. Hitler's opposition to democracy and communism, once again, is not an indication that he was opposed to the atheistic values of the Enlightenment. It just means that he had a varying interpretation of the best way to manifest the philosophical premises of the Enlightenment. 
his opposition to individualism, which is described by many as a central liberal value, was due to his Enlightenment-inspired hypernationalism, which was more typical of the German Enlightenment, as well individualism was more typical of the English Enlightenment. Nazism's supposed opposition to working class oppression as a result of the Industrial Revolution does not necessarily mean it's conservative. Um, his opposition to working class oppression is could be interpreted as mere politics, as he was trying to gain the favor of the working class uh, to gain support when the Nazi party was first beginning. This commenter wrote that the Nazi party encouraged men to marry. Um, this is a reflection of eugenics policies. And he also wrote that women were encouraged to stay at home. This is also a reflection of eugenics policies. Women that were staying at home as full-time mothers were going to have more children. And that was his goal, was to grow the Aryan race. This writer wrote that he assisted uh, Franco, and um, Franco, Francisco Franco was a, uh, he was in fact a conservative. So I'm not going to say Franco was a liberal. He was um, he was doing authentically conservative things, trying to restore a Catholic um, nation in Spain, and then it turns out he was a horrible dictator. So yeah, we're not gonna we're not gonna um, pretend that Franco was was progressive or whatnot. He was he was in fact trying to restore a Catholic regime, and he ended up being bad. He ended up being a dictator. This author for this commenter wrote how um, Franco was originally supported by Hitler and by the Vatican. Hitler and Franco would end up falling out because. Um, for one, when Hitler conquered France, Franco would basically open the border and allow up to 30,000 Jews to escape from France into Spain. Um, so that ended up causing tension. And then also Franco refused to join Hitler um, in the Axis alliance. And also Franco had a uh, he, he had a trade deals with Great Britain during World War II. So he didn't exactly continue to be an ally of Hitler, even though he was trying to not go to war with Hitler because he, he knew he would lose. At the same time, um, the Vatican did support Franco at first, and then once Franco ended up kind of revealing that he was a horrible dictator, killing his political opponents or whatnot, um, the Vatican withdrew its support, and bishops and clerics in Spain began to protest his regime. So he looked good at first, you know, and he looked conservative, and then he wasn't. So, you know, that's that. I guess it's mistakes were made by the Vatican in, in uh, trusting him at first, but... Uh, it was basically him or communist at the time, and the Vatican obviously chose him. Okay, that's enough of that. We're going to look at fascism now, Benito Mussolini's fascism. Let's look at the typical historiography of fascism, which is just defined uh, basically here by um, Wikipedia. If you were to type in what is fascism, Wikipedia would provide this answer. Fascism is a far-right, authoritarian, ultra-nationalist political ideology and movement Characterized by a, dictator, a dictatorial leader, centralized autocracy, militarism, forcible suppression of opposition, and then it names a bunch of other um, elements of uh, fascism, including a opposition to democracy, uh, socialism, Marxism, and so on. But let's draw attention especially to the very first words which typically are used to describe fascism as being a far-right um, regime, a far-right and uh, conservative style of political ideology. As I have discussed in previous videos and in the beginning of this one, I believe that typical conceptions of the above political spectrum are a bit arbitrary. What exactly, specifically, is the criteria for sorting ideologies where they are positioned on the spectrum? How do we decide that a government is very left-wing or very right-wing? Uh, do we look at how authoritarian they are? Do we look at the value that this form of government places on individual autonomy? I think that um, a better way to classify where these regimes belong on the spectrum is by looking at the philosophical origins of each of these political movements and looking at what underlying philosophical political principles guide the specific shape of these various political movements. I believe that a lot of what you see on that spectrum is an example of gaslighting. Gaslighting is the phenomenon of stating something that is really arbitrary or baseless enough times until it reaches the societal level of commonly accepted facts. 
In the last few videos, I've argued that the traditional conception of fascism and Nazism as right-wing are instances of gaslighting. There is no basis for stating that these ideologies belong on the conservative side of the spectrum of Western political ideologies, since the underlying philosophical principles beneath these ideologies were just as progressive in comparison to traditional Western values as the philosophical principles undergirding Marxism or atheistic French republicanism. So let's establish a more objective criteria for classifying political ideologies as left or right wing. I think that the most objective way to use a left-right spectrum, if we are going to use a left-right spectrum, is to look at the origin of the left-right spectrum in general. We read from Baron de Gauville, who was a participant in the 1789 French Assembly, we began to recognize each other. Those who were loyal to religion and the king took up positions to the right of the chair so as to avoid the shouts, oaths, and indecencies that enjoyed free reign in the opposing camp. So the origin of the term left wing or right wing, that right wing originally meant those in favor of the ancient Christian ordering of society towards God's service, and left wing meant the party of those in favor of overthrowing the old Christian order and establishing a new secular state based on the principles of the rationalistic enlightenment's philosophical revolution. In Ian Kershaw's landmark text, Hitler, he stated that while his Western historians, uh, that is like the United States or Great Britain, typically referred to the Nazis as an authoritarian regime to highlight its contrasts with their own liberal Republican styles of government, Marxist historians, especially in the USSR, typically referred to it as a right-wing regime to downplay the negative um, interpretation of authoritarianism, which they could be described as, and to highlight communism's defeat of the Nazis as a part of its supposed cosmic struggle to defeat the traditional conservative order in general. Recall, recall that in August of 1939, the Nazis and communists signed a non-aggression pact, indicating some level of camaraderie between the two states between, uh, before Hitler's invasion of the USSR in 1941. Even in the United States, arguably a majority of professional historians consider themselves members of the Marxist school of historiography, contributing to the widespread sense that fascism and Nazism were right-wing ideologies, because this is a part of the USSR's framing of World War II. At the same time, political ideologies require philosophical premises, and I think not enough attention is drawn to the philosophical premises, which were the foundation of political ideologies such as fascism and Nazism. To effectively categorize a political movement, one must understand what philosophical premises led to its formation. All political movements require a philosophical system to legitimize their style of government. The philosophical system outlined in Augustine's City of God legitimized the political order of medieval Christendom. And pay attention to that, because most historians accept that as common sense, as a basic fact of medieval historiography. Augustine wrote the City of God in the 5th century, and then historians are comfortable saying that those principles inspired the style of governments that medieval governments used until the 15th century. So they're saying that that philosophical movement in one book inspired... Uh, political principles for a thousand years and you know if we should be able to recognize that the political principles outlined in the enlightenment were inspiring political ideologies you know less than a 200 years later like fascism and nazism john locke's social contract theory legitimizes republicanism and democracy voltaire montesquieu and robespierre's philosophy legitimized the atheistic republic and the enlightened despotism of the French Revolution. The Atheistic Republic, of course, comes first, and then Napoleon ushers in the enlightened despotism. Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations legitimized the capitalist economic order. And Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto legitimized the communist states. I argue in the previous video that social Darwinism, the eugenics movement, and the German Enlightenment legitimized the Nazi state. Now, what philosophical premises undergirded the Italian fascist state, which served as a part, in part, an inspiration for other states, especially Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan? 
So we're going to look at those philosophical premises and we're going to rework a left-right spectrum according to the philosophical foundations of the following political ideologies, Nazism, communism, um, atheistic republicanism of the French, and then uh, American republicanism and like traditional Christian monarchies. Okay, um, And please note that it's, of course, obvious that Christian influences still existed within each of the ideologies which I'm about to describe as left-wing. Um, the influence of traditional Christendom and the individual Christian faiths of constituents of these governments could not be erased in just a couple centuries. All the same, the underlying principles legitimizing each form of government to be discussed in the next few slides were based on the Enlightenment's principles, not in the political principles of Christian tradition. And so let's classify political ideologies based on where they would have sat in the 1789 French Assembly according to their underlying philosophical principles. In this system, left wing will mean underlying left wing will mean a political ideology with an underlying belief that the state should reflect rationalistic enlightenment values which were developed independently of the Augustinian notion that the state exists to serve God. And then right wing will describe ideologies in which there is an underlying belief that the state or the city of man exists in relation to and subservience to the city of God, the church, and the state has a mission to actualize the divine will in society. Okay, this is how I would classify these ideologies, and I'll explain why for each one. Traditional Christian monarchies, such as the pre-World War I Russian Empire, still subscribe to the political ideology described above. The republicanism of the United States was inspired by a number of Enlightenment philosophers, including Locke and Montesquieu, but at the same time, nine out of the 13 original colonies listed an official religion in their state constitutions, indicating a blend of traditional right-wing and new left-wing political ideas. Political parties within liberal states existed, which sought to integrate the divine order to some extent within the secular state. This was not only in the United States, but in other uh, states as well. There were traditional Christian political movements within even uh, progressive political regimes. The British Empire integrated the ideas of Enlightenment philosophers such as Locke and Smith into a parliamentary system in which a monarch still also regulated the national, in this case Protestant, church. So there is an attempt to integrate new Enlightenment ideas with traditional right-wing Christian ideas. The French atheistic republicanism explicitly persecuted Catholicism, making it very far left. It exiled up to 30,000 priests and executed a number of clerics, bishops, monks, and even nuns, and it outlawed all religious orders. Using the materialism of the French Enlightenment and subscribing to Germanic Enlightenment ideals about the inevitable totality, Marxism deemed religion to be an oppressive institution which, institute, which was instituted to suppress the feudal peasant class making this a very left-wing ideology. Also, a quick note, I know that Karl Marx was Jewish. A lot of people commented that he was Jewish, not German. I was arguing that he was inspired by Germanic Enlightenment thought and that he was from the nation of Germany, both of which are true. I also argued in the last video, and I'll reaffirm here, that Nazism combined the German Enlightenment's worship of the folk, common belief in a global Jewish conspiracy, and scientific social Darwinism, and scientifically supported racism and eugenics, to institute an empire intent on fighting the cosmic struggle for the German folk against other races competing with it for survival. And this new um, semi-spiritual system of this cosmic struggle between the Germanic folk and other races that emerges from the atheistic German Enlightenment. It's atheistic, it does not honor a specific god, but it still has these kind of weird spiritual elements. Nazism, communism, and atheistic republicanism are each entirely opposed to the Christian god having any influence in statecraft. They are entirely motivated by rationalistic, enlightenment-inspired science in deciding the shape and goals of their states. This is the reason that Nazism, Communism, and Atheistic Republicanism are equally left-wing. Philosophically, they are each equally opposed to the divine order, and are equally in favor of imposing a new world order based upon the philosophical outgrowths of the Enlightenment. Now, where does Mussolini's fascism belong on this continuum? Is Wikipedia and common historiography in general correct in classifying fascism as being as far-right philosophically as the medieval Christian states with the above underlying beliefs? 
What if fascism should rather be classified with other left-wing political ideologies which share a desire to shape society entirely off of atheistic enlightenment principles, entirely moving beyond the intellectual and philosophical premises of Christian civilization? This is basically the commonly accepted definition of fascism with a few um, alterations based on my own um, examination of the political movement. So I would define fascism as a political ideology which exhibits completely secular institutions and will feature anti-clericalism in Catholic nations, has social Darwinistic racial theories supporting eugenics and superior race myths, has an emphasis on imperialism, hypernationalism is a key value in the ideology, has a hev heavy emphasis on industrial production, emphasizes that the means of production must be controlled by the state and not private individuals, and instills a worker bee or ant mentality amongst the people, encouraging all citizens to perceive themselves as willful servants of the state, reinforcing this uh, societal value with common mythos, which are encouraged amongst the people. Um, I've, I've beaten this horse to death by now, but as a reminder, when I use the word liberal, I'm using it to describe a system of philosophical, moral, or political thought that is free or liberal in relationship to divine revelation and the traditional Christian Western values. When I use the word conservative, uh, once again, approaching this topic as a church history, a church history channel, I am using the word conservative to describe a system of philosophical, moral, or political thought that is based upon the doctrines of divine revelation and the implications of those doctrines for modern statecraft. And so when we look at this definition of fascism, as we're about to break it down, um, most of these elements are going to be described as liberal, according to the way in which the word liberal is being used here. Having completely secular institutions is, of course, liberal and is the very um, most prominent uh, example of what it means to have a liberal political institution. Using social Darwinist racial theories to support eugenics and superior race myths are entirely elements of the Enlightenment-inspired academic thought of the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, this has no place in Christian anthropology. The heavy emphasis on imperialism as a fruit of hypernationalism and um, late industrialism that's also emerging from the Enlightenment-inspired New World Order. The means of production being controlled by the state contradicts traditional Christian um, values regarding personal private property and the worker bee or ant mentality, encouraging all citizens in a sense to see themselves as willful servants of the state. Once again, there's an element for um, nationalism or there's an element for patriotism in the Christian worldview, but serving the state as a sort of total end or serving the nationality as the end of one's existence where everything one does is to serve the nationality is in the Christian uh, opinion a form of idolatry. Now when we talk about fascism here it's also interesting to note that fascism is often um, conflated with other ideologies that existed in the 20th century and it's way over inflated in today's political discourse. And an immediate problem with attempted definitions of fascism, like the really long one we saw from Wikipedia, is that they usually assume that Italian fascism, German Nazism, and Japanese imperialism exercised a common form of government. And so these definitions seek to identify what all these governments had in common. While these states were inspired by one another, it is debated whether their governments exercised enough common traits to be designated as a governmental category in and of themselves. Uh, the Nazis and the Japanese, for example, did not consider themselves to be fascists, even if they were inspired by what Mussolini had done in Italy. The term fascism itself comes from the Italian fascio, or bundle of sticks. In the 1920s, the term fascist was understood as referring to a single political party in Italy. In 1919, Mussolini consolidated a revolutionary movement which bore that name into the Fasci Italiani di Combattimento, the Italian fascists of combat, and two years later, he organized this movement into the Nationalist Fascist Party. This party was an outgrowth of Mussolini's newspaper, Il Popolo d'Italia. The newspaper was originally formed as a pro-World War I and pro-Irredentist or Italian imperialist newspaper 
by uh, funded by Giuseppe Pontramelli, who was himself a 33rd degree Mason and was formed by Mussolini. Early editions of the newspaper championed quotes such as Napoleon Bonaparte's The Revolution is an Idea Which Has Found Bayonets, betraying the liberal Enlightenment-inspired philosophical principles which were the foundation of this newspaper, which was the foundation of the fascist movement. This kind of reviews information I just said. If you want to read this further clarification, you can. I'm going to just move on for the sake of time. Let's address the philosophical foundations of fascism, especially the philosophical beliefs of Benito Mussolini, who is basically um, inseparable with Italian fascism. Mussolini himself was an atheist. His first published book was titled God Does Not Exist. In this text, he echoed Marxist ideas. He said, quote, Religion in science is an absurdity, in practice an immorality, and in men a disease, end quote. He once wrote that Catholicism was, quote, a minor sect that had spread beyond Palestine only because grafted onto the organization of the Roman Empire, end quote. In other words, he viewed Catholicism as a sort of parasite which had kind of um, latched on to the Roman Empire and had kind of outlived it. This is very Enlightenment-inspired, atheistic, liberal, philosophical ideas. As dictator, Mussolini found it pragmatic to cooperate with the church in order to gain the support of the great numbers of Italian Catholics. He shared anti-Semitic sentiments with the Nazis, but he feared losing Italian support if he pursued these sentiments in a manner similar to the Germans, for it was evident that the Vatican was opposed to race-based race extermination. Mussolini's political trajectory was similar to that of Napoleon. He entered politics at first inspired by the liberal ideals of the age, but he became autocratic as a result of believing it would be a more effective means of promoting his liberal vision for the Italian Empire. Here are some quotes by Mussolini which we're going to discuss, and we're going to show that these quotes reveal a um, liberal philosophical mindset. So Mussolini said, Religion is man-made to assist in controlling the weak-minded individuals because during times of atrocities and despair, they feel strength in numbers. This quote is entirely echoing Karl Marx's idea that religion is the opium of the people. He once said, democracy is talking itself to death. The people do not know what they want. They do not know what is the best for them. There is too much foolishness, too much lost motion. I have stopped the talk and the nonsense. I am a man of action. Democracy is beautiful in theory. In practice, it is a fallacy. You in America will see that someday. I think that a lot of Democrats in America are seeing that today. Um, when you look at the coercion over things that should be a matter of conscience, such as um, the policies that were trying to mandate um, different COVID-related things, vaccines or whatnot, that um, were completely agreeing with what Mussolini is saying here. The people do not know what is best for them. Um, he stopped the talk and nonsense. He's a man of action, imposing his will upon the people. It's demonstrating why he lost trust in the democratic process, as the similarly liberal Napoleon also did when he overthrew the French Republic and established the empire. Napoleon once said, in a great nation, the majority are incapable of judging wisely of things. So he sees himself as the enlightened despot who needs to basically give the dog its medicine and force the people to accept his uh, atheistic beliefs and values. He said, the state, in fact, as the universal ethical will is the creator of the right, of right. So he's saying that human rights originate in the state because he does not believe in God. This is showing his atheistic or philosophically liberal concept of human rights. And if states are the originators of human rights, the state can legitimately dispense with human rights. Um, this is a major issue with totalitarian liberal regimes, such as Marxism, but also we saw it in fascism and in Nazis, uh, Nazi, the Nazi regime. He also shows he's influenced by the philosophically liberal work of Nietzsche. He says, we do not argue with those who disagree with us, we destroy them. Now, in the liberal, uh, in the 1919 fascist platform, when Mussolini was first trying to um, gain political seats in the Italian parliament, the Italian pro-war imperialists' hopes for World War I were, mo were mostly realized by the end of World War I. The Allies granted Italy the territories of South Tyrol, Trentino, Istria, and Treste from Austria-Hungary. 
These nationalists, who were supporters of Mussolini, however, were furious that Italy was not also granted the territory of Fiume and the region of Dalmatia. Mussolini dreamed of uniting military veterans into a new ruling class. Inspired by Nietzsche's nihilistic legitimization of political violence, the fascist party organized into paramilitary structures and attacked political rivals. In 1915, a socialist newspaper's headquarters was destroyed by fascists. In its early years, Mussolini was a champion of traditional liberal values. He said, quote, We are libertarians above all, loving liberty for everyone, even for our enemies. End quote. He said that freedom of speech was, quote, the highest expression of human civilization. End quote. The fascist political platform in 1919 supported anti clerical legislation. He also supported universal suffrage for men and women, and he also supported the abolition of any claims based on concepts of outdated nobility for privileges in the Italian state. However, with this platform, the fascists did quite poorly in the 1919 elections, and the socialists gained the largest party in parliament. Fear of the rise of a communist state allowed Mussolini to position his party as an opponent of communism to gain uh, political favor with the constituents of the Italian Republic. Donations from large corporations who feared a Marxist takeover and paramilitary activity led his party to nearly start a civil war, violently attacking socialist leaders regularly. Mussolini began to describe his party as being on the extreme right in the early 1920s. However, he did this mostly to position his movement in opposition to communism and to make it more favorable to the largely Catholic uh, constituents of the Italian Republic. In the, same in the same time period, he began to integrate social Darwinism and eugenics ideas to refer to Italians as being the superior race, and he began to promote a foreign policy centered around the mythos of reestablishing the Roman Empire, and he wanted to establish, wanted to um, expand the Roman Empire, as he was calling the Italian regime, and uh, he was using, you know, he was just borrowing from uh, 19th century hyper-nationalistic imperialist values, but framing it as the reestablishing of the Roman Empire. Fascists envisioned an economic structure in which corporations and workers settled disputes internally instead of through class conflict, and in which corporations themselves were directed by the state. This is the signature economic feature of fascism and also why Nazis contain the title socialist, because there was this socialized concept of the economy in which all corporations were ultimately directed by the state and the economy was directly controlled by the state. James Greger argued that fascism was a reinterpretation of Marxism rather than a diametrically opposed economic system. And uh, there's the source there if you want to see James Greger's uh, work where he makes that argument. The historian Stanley Payne demonstrated in the source you see there that Italian fascists may have been opposed to communism, but were just as much opposed to reactionary conservatism, which sought to reestablish a traditional Christian order. As I stated, Mussolini also promoted a common mythos of identifying the Italian ethnicity as the inheritor of the Roman Empire, legitimizing imperial conquests throughout the Mediterranean. Fascism, then, was a product of a variety of progressive, liberal, atheistic, enlightenment principles, including social Darwinism and eugenics, the hypernationalism born of the secularization of European states, Marx's economic socialism, which he revised while not outright rejecting, and 19th century secular imperialism. All the same, Fascism believed continuity with tradition was needed in order to establish national coherence, so it wasn't as anti-traditional on the surface as other liberal movements. To its core, however, fascism was a shoot from the tree of Enlightenment-inspired liberalism, once again, liberalism in the way that I'm defining it, which is a way that it can be used to define um, political movements for multiple centuries, not just on a decade-by-decade -decade basis. And fascism was perhaps even a stepbrother of Marxism. Fascism then was in fact based upon a rejection of Christian political premises and a goal to form a state based off of the liberal premises which were created either during the Enlightenment or were generated from schools of thought which descended from the materialistic rationalism of the Enlightenment. While disagreeing in specificity about the form of state which best embodied the secular, atheistic, or materialistic ideals which were born of the Enlightenment with other forms of liberal government, such as communists or republicanism, fascism is nevertheless amongst the
the various left-wing ideologies of the 20th century. Antifa is an atheistic organization which today seeks to impose their atheistic secular values upon the United States through the use of political violence and intimidation against their political opponents. So, sorry Antifa, you have a lot in common with fascists, who formally rose to power after their series of violent attacks upon their political opponents, and finally their mostly peaceful march on Rome in 1922, after which Mussolini was granted power by the Italian king over the Italian state. Mussolini once said, We do not argue with those who disagree with us. We destroy them. And many in uh, today's political scene agree with that philosophical principle. So in review, we did a lengthy historiographical overview of the type of historiography that I use on this channel, especially as I've been looking at 20th century developments. I've been looking at them in the broader strokes of the changes in Western civilization in general because I'm examining the story of the church, and so I'm more interested in the broad history of Western civilization than the very narrow history of, say, the 1920s and 30s. I presented a critique of the traditional historiography of left-right wing political categorizations. I proposed a new classification. If we are going to use a left-right spectrum, I think it should be based upon the philosophical principles undergirding political ideologies. And so I presented a new um, political spectrum based on that different, basically, uh, principle of how to classify ideologies. We examined the philosophical foundations of Mussolini's fascism, and then we properly, and then we properly placed the fascist movement according to the philosophical commonalities with other political movements of the 19th and 20th centuries. Let us conclude with a prayer. In the nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Ave Maria, gratia plena Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus et benedictus fructus ventris tui Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in mortis, nostre. Amen. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritui Sancti. Thank you very much for watching. May Almighty God remove from your minds anything I've said incorrect or untrue. We'll see you next time. Bye.